And so when you're looking at projects, what you have to do is the projects compete with each other for capital. You know, it sounds like that's a bad thing, but that's actually a really good thing to have. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Oliver Blechner, EVP of Juicy Holdings. Oliver, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Kellen. Great to see you guys. Good to see you. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Really excited to talk to Oliver. Really excited to kind of dive into uh, the inner workings of Juicy. How are you, Brian? I'm excited to dive in. Obviously, M&A is a big part of the cannabis industry and getting Oliver's perspective is going to be really exciting. But for the record, Oliver, we have a little East Coast, West Coast battle. So uh, your location, please. I'm in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm not entering that battle. Love the East Coast and love the West Coast too. Yeah, Still love here. That's fair. We'll, 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 put you right like in, we'll put you right in the middle with a slight nod to the right. <laughs> <laughs> so Oliver, for our listeners, can you give a little background about yourself? Yeah, sure. So yeah, my name is Oliver Blechner. I grew up in Switzerland, always wanted to live in the States and finally managed to do so for, for college. Went to, uh, went to school in Philadelphia and then managed to live in New York for a while, in London, and now here. I spent most of my, I spent most of my, really wanted to live in LA too, but I had a, had a girlfriend in New York, so I didn't. I spent most of my career as an investor. I did, I did kind of my initial tour of duty five years in investment banking. Learned pretty quickly that I really was much more interested in being part of making decisions and, and, and creating things rather than, uh, rather than just advising on that. And then spent most of my career until this in the, in the hedge fund industry, particularly in distressed debt. So I invested in companies and countries that were in trouble. Um, really, with a you know, when everyone's running away, I was running towards it, and really did that with a view, with a view to rebuilding companies and uh, and make money that way. By the way, there's a little bit of review out there that you make money by liquidating companies and tearing them to pieces. That's not how you make money. You rebuild them, and you know, did a did a few. Was privileged enough to to do a big a few big restructurings that uh we restructured caesars i was part of the official court committee for for doing that that was that was great fun and i'd actually beginning of my my career on the buy side i, I worked for the guy that is now the ceo of Jushi, jim cassiopo which stayed in touch over the years and you know by the beginning of 2018 i've been doing the hedge fund thing for a while distressed debt we were sort of in the middle of a bull market right after a while Financial crisis and after you get some pretty interesting things to work on, then as the bull market continues, the opportunities get worse and worse, and you're sort of stretching what you're what you're what you're doing in order to stay in business. And then Jim called and said, "Hey, been investing in cannabis for a while, very successfully. So in in Canada, I want to start something in the U.S. or have to start at something in the U.S. You're not doing anything useful. <laughs> why don't you come and why don't you come?" <laughs> And and do that. So you know, after a 17 year stint in London, moved myself, and my family here to uh, to South Florida, beautiful South Florida, and uh, we got going with uh, we got going with with Jushi. And was there any? I think it was number five or six, something like that. So yeah, that's my background. I've been an investor all my life, and in many ways, what I do now is. Similar and in some ways it's it's dissimilar. So the similar part is what are we here to do? We're we're here to try and figure out really good opportunities um, that we're buying at the right value. We're 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 doing in depth due diligence to make sure we're not buying something that turns out to be a huge problem later on for the company. Right, you're, you're trying to avoid liabilities. You're trying to avoid tax issues, compliance issues. You really don't want to deal with with uh, with any compliance issues, for example. Um, but I do it. What we do here, it, it's a much wider spectrum of people that I get to to deal with. This is everything from, you know, a social equity applicant in LA or Illinois that won one license that represents his or her entire net worth. Most likely, doesn't have deal experience. So you got to be able to really. I don't know if it's bonding, but you you, you, you got to be able to to talk on that level um, in a way that that makes sense to them, right? We're not here to cheat anybody. We want to do good deals and we want people to feel good about the deals they do with us, all the way to kind of big companies, which is probably more what I what I was used to. So that's kind of the background. Was there any hesitancy jumping into cannabis? You know, I'm 
not really. There probably should have been. <laughs> with, with hindsight. Not really. I'm, I'm one of those. I don't know. I've, I've been lucky in my career. I've worked for good people. I have great mentors. And one of the things that I noticed is the trades or the decisions that I made that turned out to be the best were those that were really obvious to me very, very quickly. This one, I don't know, Jim called me in the sort of beginning of 2018. I took a look at the, the, the pitch book they had for Jushi. I think maybe two or three weeks later, I was on a plane going out to Colorado, meeting, meeting the partners, taking a look. Um, a week later, I'm calling my ex-wife saying, hey, I know you like London, but let's move. <laughs> and I want to bring the kids and I want to bring you and let's do it. I, I think the whole thing, you know, I, I kind of totally changed my life within, with two, within two months. And the way I thought about it is, this is probably the only opportunity I'm going to get in my lifetime to be part of shaping what is a huge industry in, in the US and one that I think is already doing will continue to provide great benefits to, to, to people across the country and maybe, maybe globally. I think the fact that it's um, now federally illegal or was illegal anywhere is, 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 is silly and motivated by a lot of things that just, I mean, just silly. And so, no, I was investment thesis was very, very clear to me. I didn't hesitate at all. Just jumped in. Now, five years later, okay, well, learned a few things. I'm still very excited about it. But one of the things to highlight is you guys know this as well. Nothing is as easy as it looks. And in cannabis, it's probably twice as hard as it should be. And that's because we're dealing with a, at a complex web of regulations across every state. It's different. We're dealing with the federal legal. We're dealing with 280E. At some point, people are going to write books about the sort of things that uh, we and others did in the industry during this time. But at the same time, I think we're doing something that really contributes to making, making the world better. And if we do it right, we're going to make some money doing it, which you do both at the same time. That sounds pretty good to me. So yeah, I, I didn't really hesitate. But it's, it's, it's much harder than I initially thought it would be. I like to usually say that cannabis is full of challenges. And I think for people inside the industry, that really resonates. But people outside the industry kind of ask, like, what does that really mean? And I think once you kind of step inside the industry, you recognize that cannabis is just absolutely full of challenges. So I want to stay with that kind of early stage uh, jumping in. Obviously, having the relationship with Jim is massive with making that leap and probably leads to an easier transition from outside industry into in. So talk to us about those early days were like. What was Shushi like early on? And then what was your early mission when kind of joining the team? Yeah. So, you know, I was in the same role that, that, that I was in now. Um, you know, Shushi had just been formed. They, it had gone through its initial cap raise. I forget what that was, 28 or 30 million. It was some money around. It had it had a couple of it had a couple of small investments. I mean, it was just a it was a tiny startup that fit into a very small office space or five six people. And it actually started when I moved here. We had a we had a meeting at Jim's home. The entire company could actually fit around the dining table, and we had sessions where we basically discussed, hey, which states do we want to be in? Where do we where do we want to focus? Um, what should the strategy be? And you know, some of the initial kind of Reads were, by the way, you make decisions up front, then you kind of go along and then you adjust. I think that's, that's just the nature of entrepreneurship. It's, it's the nature of decision making. And you learn more and you adjust and stuff happens and stuff changes. So, one of the things that we, I think, quickly decided early on was that we were going to try and be retail only in limited license markets because that, you know, when you're, when you're running a hedge fund, you're always looking at, you're looking at the portfolio as a, as a, as a whole. So let's say you have a portfolio that's pretty concentrated. You have 20 positions. Some are, you express them in percent of your, of your net asset value. So you have like 1% positions, 5% positions, maybe 10% positions. If you mess up a 10% position, that's not so good. So. I'm talking about the benefit of diversification. Um, having a diversified set of retail stores in limited license locations, that made sense to us. Ah, limited license, that's good. Um, diversified, that's good. It probably costs, I don't know, somewhere around a million, million and a half to, to build out the store. So in a world where you have a portfolio, you're going to make some decisions, hopefully, that turn out to be really great. In fact, better than you thought they were going to be. Then you have hopefully a lot of stuff that's kind of in the middle is good as you thought. And you'll have a few things that didn't work out the way you thought. Okay, so if you mess up a store, you sunk a million, million and a half into it, not to be glib about that kind of money, but the company survives. And you can probably move the store. We did that 
for a while until we, we we had licenses to operate many stores in in Pennsylvania. We were bringing those online, so we had licenses, and then we're opening. By the way, now we have 18 stores in Pennsylvania. I think when we got to five or six, we discovered that it's actually kind of at the time it was tough to get really great products on our shelves. So the producers were putting the great product on their own shelves. So that's when we started vertically integrating. That happened two years ago, so about you know two and a half years into into Jushi's existence. The other thing we thought in the beginning, we really raised money thinking we're going to go into New York and Florida. And we actually had a, had a, had a 20% stake in a license in, in New York. They found another buyer. We could either match or not match. We actually decided to sell at the time. We made 4x our money. And then we had, a, we had an argument with somebody over, over, over Florida. We don't have to go into the detail on that. But today, we are not in New York. We are not in Florida. Um, really, the core of the company is Pennsylvania. I think we're tied to the second largest retailer, 18 stores. We bought um, Goodness Growth's grower processor during COVID. I think we closed in July or August of 2020. We've put another $50 million of CapEx into that facility. We've totally redone it. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I just saw it three weeks ago again, having not seen it since we first acquired it. And it is 50 million will do a lot when you know what to do with it. We, it's an amazing facility and it is ready for expansion when adult use comes in Pennsylvania as well. Um, second key to the company is Virginia. We own the license um, for HSA 2, which is basically Northern Virginia, Alexandria, Arlington, Tyson's Corner, Amazon HQ2, it's a suburb of DC. Um, we think of that, that's probably the best license in the US. It's two and a half million people that we serve. Um, only us at the moment. It's going out of use in January 1st, 2024. And then we have four monster stores in, in Illinois. They're doing about 80 million plus of revenue. Um, none of that was in the original business plan. You know, we have other businesses that we acquired in Massachusetts, Nevada, Ohio, California. So things are very different than, uh, than, than we initially thought they were going to be, but that's not a surprise. I think that's just, that's just the nature of, of, of building business. You, you kind of, you bob and weave when you adjust as you learn and you take advantage of opportunities, which I think as a company we've done, I think we've done, I'm, I'm really proud of the job that we've done. When you guys decided to go vertical, um, how is the, the conversation based on buying versus building? Did you guys determine that there were certain sectors of the, the supply chain that you wanted to, to buy and then there was other sectors that you wanted to build or was it kind of just, you just crossed the bridge when you guys got there? Yeah, I think a lot of that is driven by, by regulation. So really, that was driven for us. If you look at it, when we started, we had no business. First, we had no business, and we had no people, and we had no money. Then we had no business, no people, and we had some money, but not that much, and we had to figure out what to do with it. Then all of a sudden, we had a bunch of licenses um, in Pennsylvania, and we had, we had stores in Illinois that we could operationalize. So put yourself back in like March 20, 2020, April 2020, COVID starts, our stores thankfully stay open. We're considered a central business everywhere that we, that we operate, you know, by, by May, June, we have confidence back in our ability to, to continue running the stores, but we knew we needed to get vertically integrated specifically in, Pens- specifically in Pennsylvania. That was going to be important to us. It's a limited license market. I mean, even if you're building, you got to buy a license. You got to buy a license that's valid. There weren't any spare licenses, and so what you're looking for is. I mean, we basically talked to everyone that wasn't connected with an, with an MSO, all the independents, and kind of you know this one was owned by by Vario. Now, goodness, growth. They had some pressure to to generate cash. We actually didn't have the money to buy it, so we. We had to raise money during that period as well to try and get that done. We're proud that we were able to get it done. I will say we've done, when it comes to GPs, buy versus build, we've done it all, right? We, we, we bought in Pennsylvania, but I can tell you we have, it's unrecognizable compared to what we bought. I mean, what we did with it, we didn't just expand. We have, we, the, the fundamentals of this building are, are, are totally changed. When we bought it, it wasn't designed to produce high quality flour. It had been built by the original owner to basically produce trim for extract. They didn't believe in smoking. So that's what they wanted to do. We want to have a full suite of products for our patients and our consumers. That includes having the ability to put out this beautiful AB bod um, for, for, for our customers. So we have to change everything. Um, you have to change HVAC. You have to change I mean, just all of it. And, and we did that. 
Um, we also acquired facilities in Massachusetts. We've acquired in Ohio. We've acquired in, uh, in Nevada. And then in Virginia, we built from the ground up. So in Virginia, we've now invested over $70 million into, into, into the facility. I can tell you this. It's actually, it is way easier to, buy, to build something from scratch and do it the right way. I mean, easier. Took two plus years. Took seventy million dollars. <laughs> there's nothing. There's, there's nothing. There's nothing easy about that. You know, internally we're calling it the big bet. That is our. That is our. You know, Virginia is our big bet. But you know what you're getting. Buying an existing facility is it's almost like buying kind of a, a big house. You do all the work. You do all the due diligence. You look everywhere. You get the experts to go through the checklist. But when you're starting renovations two years after you own it, you're going to discover stuff you didn't know about before. There's always something. I think we're back to that theme of it's not easy. Um, but I think we've shown that we can do it and we can build, we can buy. Almost like everything that we look at, almost. Um, I think we want to be intellectually flexible and just be open to... We're not religious in the sense that we say, we will only buy or we will only build. I think you try and just be commonsensical about it. And in any given situation, let's look at all the options, what are the pros, what are the cons, and then make the right decisions. So when, when you were building out that facility and investing the $50 million, was that part of the initial understanding when you purchased the facility was that this was going to be a complete tear down and build out? And then forecasting it out, how do you see an ROI standpoint of understanding that it's worth investing X amount of money. Obviously, it needs to be arranged, like you were saying, with the house standpoint. Unfortunately, in my experience, when you're doing home renovation projects, you're always going over budgets because the contractors are always <laughs> finding more problems. So is that something that came about similar to your, to your experience? Yeah. And, but by the way, you sort of know that. You know when you're looking at your initial estimates, this is probably going to take longer. It's going to cost me more money. So you, you, you sort of built that into, into your calculation when you're thinking about it. Absolutely. I mean, we hadn't... By the time we bought it, we hadn't yet, yet made. We knew we were going to put more money in, and I wouldn't call it a tear down. Just kind of a massive, massive improvement and an addition that we did. Um, you know, we actually went out and we bought most of the real estate around our financing in like a series of additional deals after that because we didn't want to be landlocked. So one of the things you want with a GP is you want flexibility. So if one day you decide it makes sense to expand, you want to have the ability to, to do that. That was a big consideration for us. And we looked at a number of different um, sort of CapEx options as part of the analysis we did um, when we decided whether to buy it or not. But we hadn't yet fully committed to, to one or the other. And then over time, Pennsylvania, um, you know, you're getting closer and closer to, to, to adult use. So yes, we knew we were going to spend substantial amounts of money doing it. Same thing with you know Virginia when we bought the license. I mean, we knew we had to put a lot of money into into the building. Um, maybe not that amount, maybe not that timing, but over over time, the decisions kind of arrived to that result. I think one of the things that are most fascinating in this experience is like you're saying that each state is kind of independent and different. So investing 50 million in Pennsylvania might limit your opportunities for an acquisition in another state. So from a decision making standpoint, are those variables also considered? Saying like, hey. We need to have funds available for acquisition in, in Territory X? It's a really good question. Absolutely. So one of the things that's so fascinating about cannabis now, fascinating and, and difficult about it is we are in a capital-intensive and capital-consuming industry. That's because we're building the infrastructure, right? And when I say we, I mean the industry as a whole. CapEx, CapEx, CapEx. You've got to build these facilities. They're going to get bigger. They're going to get more efficient. They're going to put better product out over over time. So, you know, we're kind of recreating um, a whole infrastructure. But on the other side, we're we're in, in in an industry where capital is either kind of available or it's totally not there at all. Uh, I sort of joke with my friends, and, you know, when they call like, "Hey, how are you doing?" I'm like, "Yeah, I don't know, fifth year in cannabis, fifth bear market." It's maybe maybe not the fifth, but it's certainly the third or or the fourth. And we've been in a bear market in this bear market now for it's got to be like a year, a year and a half, right? Um, before that, you could raise equity capital, then you know you could raise debt after that. And I'd say, I mean, we fortunately we, we just we just announced a refinancing of a of a big debt piece, so we were still able to do that. But capital is hard to come by. And so when you're looking at projects, what you have to do is the projects compete with each other for capital. You know, it sounds like that's a bad thing, but that's actually a really good thing to have. You want projects to compete with each other. 
because that's also one of the things that keeps you intellectually honest in, internally. Hey, you want to, you know, here's a proposal. You want to go by, I don't know, making it up. You want to go by licensing Maryland. Great. How much cash is that going to take? Great. How does that compare to what we're doing when we're putting CapEx into Virginia or Pennsylvania? So one of the things that we looked at is we think when we're investing a dollar of CapEx into expansions in Virginia and Pennsylvania, we think we're doing that at a two times EBITDA multiple. Um, it's another way of saying that's really, really, really attractive, really cheap. It's hard to buy companies at that. Now, we've done some pretty good acquisitions along the way as well. You know, super proud of our acquisition track record. But yeah, things compete. And we have to make decisions constantly about does it make sense? You know, buy versus build, new market versus existing market. And that, that informs strategy. So if you ask me today, what are, you, what are the focus areas? Well, focus areas are when Illinois, we have four stores that are open. We want to license in Peoria. We're opening that up to the fifth store. You're allowed to own 10 stores. Okay. Well, five licenses and building those out in great locations, that makes sense. So that's strengthening an in-market position. Um, we're clearly going to open up. Right now, we're at four stores in Virginia. Fifth one is opening. Um, probably in January, it's pretty close to being done in Arlington. Great store, really beautiful location, just by Whole Foods. It's the sort of thing, you know, in cannabis, you usually don't get those kind of locations. It's just amazing. And uh, six stores going to open. Um, and then we're in Ohio. We're opening in Cincinnati or in the Cincinnati area. You know, Ohio, you're allowed to own five. We bought a GP. We have a small GP. Well, we have a small grower and we have a small processor. It makes sense to be vertically integrated. We'd love to have five stores. Ohio had new licenses come out last year, so I'm in market to to try and buy four. Right location, right price. That makes sense. To enter like a new state, man, particularly if it's on the GP side, you got to be able to follow that with um, there's typically capex that happens after. I'd say it would have to be, and we're looking at a lot of things. It has to be just an extraordinarily great opportunity for us to want to do that. So the the in price has to be very attractive. Um, we think salaries, for example, everyone always wants cash. <laughs> that seems to be the, the, the thing to do. There's any cash in the industry, okay? Uh, the, the cash you have, you want for your operations, you want for CapEx, you don't want to pay for acquisitions with cash. So the next thing you're looking at is we're a public company, we think we have a very attractive stock. The right seller for us is somebody who understands that you're not really just selling your company. You're effectively exchanging your private company stock for a publicly traded stock. So it has to be priced very well because we think our stock is priced very cheaply, right? So the exchange has got to make sense for 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 both. It can't add any leverage. We don't want any more debt. Um, it can't be... Uh, these days, we wouldn't do like a distressed asset turnaround where we have to put 30, 40, 50 million to fix it. Don't want to do that. I want to do... Easy, cheap deals with great people in great locations, and of course, life doesn't work quite work that way. So, you know, we're working very, very hard. We'll we'll find something that we'll find things that make sense. I can already see on our horizon. Companies are running out of money. There's opportunities um, for us to make both our lives and their lives better, but the conditions have to be the conditions have to be great. Just to clarify, what is GP? Grower processor. Grower processor. No, it's so fine. I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page with that term. Yeah, sorry about that. It's the it's the, the the cultivation business and the processing business. I just call it a GP. It's of course it has a different name in every state because every regulator has a different name for it. And I just say GP. So I guess expanding on that, I mean, is there is there a deal flow that comes through? Do you have to do the outbound to start reaching out to people in Maryland and Florida and California? Like, obviously there's a small industry, but the people that are 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 doing these sort of negotiations, how, how does that information kind of consume? And how are you kind of being privy to the information that says like this person might be interested in selling their business at a later time? Yeah, there's 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 a bit of both, and it's changed over time. So when we started. Nobody was talking to us because nobody knew anything about us and we didn't have anything. And, you know, we kind of had to do, you get on the phone, you get on the plane, you you sort of decide these are the markets I want to look at. And 
you do you do what I used to do in distress stats. So one of the things that's interesting about distress is you never know what you're going to look at in any given year, right? You don't know which country is going to have issues. You don't know which industry is going to have issues. One year it's telcos in the U.S. The next year it's merchant energy plants in the U.K. Then it's I don't know banks in Greece and Portugal. Then it's I don't know Dubai real estate companies. It's like new. You don't know anybody and you don't know really what to do. But what you do know is, huh? I probably just need to get in there and talk to everyone and meet everyone. People like to talk. You can pretty you know you can figure out who you can do a deal with. Right, you can figure out in the conversation reasonable, not reasonable, interesting asset, difficult to own. Or, I mean, you can kind of you can kind of piece it together. And after you spend enough time in a state talking, I think if you talk to like the four or five top players in every state, and you talk enough, and you go back, you kind of figure out what's going on. Um, so that's that's what we did, and that's what we continue doing. Finance a little bit. The sourcing side is maybe a little bit easier because we have a track record, right? I can I can show any, anyone that's not sure about doing business with us or with anyone in the industry, we can show. Is our track record? They can talk to sellers that have done deals with us. They're very satisfied with with the transactions they they did with us. The bankers know that we're reliable. When we say something, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it. Um, they know they can probably get a fee out of us. We're real. So yeah, we have bankers calling us, we've got brokers calling us, but a lot of it is it's just outreach, right? Illinois licenses. There's not an investment banker that wants to sell those. You gotta just get on the phone and call everyone and see which calls you get returned. You gotta go on location. So it's it's just it's old school origination work. So with the industry consolidating, would you say this is a, a buyer's market? It's definitely a buyer's market because there's a lot of sellers and not, not a lot of not a lot of buyers. I, I'd say that's true in in every state that I that I look at. Um, yeah, I mean, look at look at Illinois. They gave us uh, 190 licenses. We think for all the MSOs that they wanted to get to their maximum, there was maybe demand for 20 or 30 of them. You know, the others you're either building them yourself or you're reselling, but just not a lot of buyers. When we were looking at Massachusetts, by the time we started looking four years ago, um, maybe by now it's like four and a half years ago. For years, we thought that people's sellers' price expectations just stood in no relation to 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 reality. I'm saying this in a in an understated way; it just didn't make any sense at all. And then, almost every MSO over time acquired a position in Massachusetts. And so, by the time you know, we kept looking, by the time we actually found an asset that we that we that we like, I don't want to say we're the only game in town. You're, you're hardly ever the only game in town, but one of the only one of the only games games in town. So definitively a buyer's market, but also one where, you know, buyer's seller's market, it's tough. When there's a lot of pricing uncertainty and things have gone down, particularly when you're dealing with um, inexperienced sellers that are private individuals, you know, it's, it's tough to adjust, right? They, they look at it and say, yeah, but hold on. Chicago license traded for $5 million. You know, there may have been a year ago, there hasn't been a single deal since, and that value doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And all the stocks in the index are down 70%, but they still think 5 million. Because one of the last things you want to do is, right, let's say, turn around and sell yours for three, and then some other sells it, some other guy sells it for five, and it was the only asset you had in life. I mean, I, I understand the uncertainty, but prices are sticky. Um, I think what we're seeing now is, um, now that more time is passing, I'm seeing this in Illinois, I'm seeing this in Ohio, I'm seeing this in other markets. Um, people are coming to the table. They get it. Right? 18 months of a bear market is enough to convince somebody that, uh, that, that things aren't, aren't, aren't as good. But on the other hand, if you're getting stock, you're getting my stock at today's value. Not at, I mean, we traded as high as almost nine bucks. So it's, it's, it's awful. It's awful lot. So. I get this question a lot. What would you do if you were me? I get this from sellers and I always say, well, don't concentrate on the headline number. Like, you know, the number that's going to be in the press release. Focus on how you're getting it. If you're getting it in stock and that stock can go, you know, two times, three times, four times, five X over the next few years, right? Think five, six years. That's how you get really, I mean, that's how you make money. Yeah, also uh, kind of getting out of the industry for those people who are, are fatigued. I mean, it, it makes sense for an alignment with a bigger partner like yourself, especially if you're looking to exit. Unfortunately, uh, during turbulent times, uh, the prices have changed pretty drastically. So the valuation you thought you were going to get three years ago is likely very different. So kind of continuing on that path. Are you taking it in stock? That's a lot. Makes sense. Yeah. You're, doing, you're exchanging it and you want to do it with a group. 
a company that you believe in where I think focus on management team and the quality management team is very important. What track record do they have of making good decisions and building things and, and, and exiting things? And then saying, and then I think you really ought to think about, you know, keeping your money. You don't want to take your chips off the table now. There's a horrible time to be doing it. Right. Keep them in there. Have other people, you know, have us do the hard work, take the stock, we'll do the work. And, uh, you know, we're we're certainly all extremely incentivized to, uh, to 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 find good things to do with this over over the next few years. So, kind of continuing on the strategy standpoint, like in states like Arizona, where there was kind of like a land grab to pick up some of those assets, do those decisions of what your competitors do influence kind of accelerating positions in certain areas? If you want to get, let's say, into a certain region, but your competitors are hopping in, does that make your team feel more comfortable with overspending, or kind of competition doesn't lead to you know irrational emotional decisions? Never comfortable with overspending. That's one thing. I, I don't know. I, not really. I'd say the most wonderful thing is when you're the first to do something and then you see your competitors come in and do the same thing and maybe at higher prices. That was our experience in Pennsylvania, for example. So we put our, our store portfolio together for, for, for much less than any of our competitors than have to buy them. We bought our GP for a much lower price than our competitors did after us. That feels pretty good. You know, it's nice to have other smart companies in the space validate your thesis. When it came to Arizona, so maybe this is a distress thing. Jim had that. John Barrick, our president, came came out of that industry. You sort of you pay attention to what the crowd does because you have to. And you could be wrong with your thoughts. You have to be open to to that idea. But you don't do something just because everybody else is is doing it. You you analyze things on, on their own merit. Arizona is actually a really good example. So for years, I was getting calls about Arizona. And every time an Arizona business was shown to us, it was, I don't know, I'm making it up. I'm going to be directly correct. Let's say the industry deals were getting done at five and a half, six times. This is like before the spare market. Arizona was eight. Why did Arizona have it so, so expensive? I remember one specific conversation with a broker that, that, I, that I really like. He said, because it's Arizona. And I'm thinking, you know, I've done deals for banks in Portugal and real estate companies in Dubai and I don't know, telco companies in Argentina. Things really are that different. Just because it's Arizona, I don't know why why will be why it will be any different. But I think if you look at it, it's okay, you you had a couple of MSOs that were really determined to get big in that market. And, you know, can you pay up a multiple for your marginal sixth or seventh dispensary to build out your position and finish it up? Of course you can. It makes sense for them. Does it make sense for me to buy my first one at a at a at a at a at a huge price? No. And by the way, we look at Arizona. It's a, it's a bloodbath. Everyone everyone came in. I think everyone paid a lot of money, and that's super super competitive. So almost like everyone doing it is is maybe if anything, it's it's more of a turn off than it is a a, a turn on. We're just we're very data driven. We're very analysis driven. We do not want to overpay. Um, we do not want to take on risks that are, you know, where, where, where the payoff just doesn't make sense by comparison to the risk. I think that's why shareholders and debt holders have entrusted us with, with capital in the first place. So, yeah, you look, but you don't let it inform your strategy. And uh, I've never once lost even 30 seconds of sleep over not being in Arizona. No daylight savings. Nothing time, right? against Arizonians or Arizona, by the way. If a, if a great thing came along in Arizona, we'll totally look at it. I feel like the headline tomorrow is going to be Juicy. Juicy acquires a company in Arizona. <laughs> this is just a, <laughs> no. just a tease piece out. <laughs> so, Oliver, one of the things that fascinates me most about MA is that people get so excited about bringing two organizations together. And sure, from a behind the scenes standpoint, that's one of the biggest challenges. But the real work seems to happen after developing the synergies of the organizations and letting the organizations kind of blend together and then kind of having that true ROI happen. Do you think sometimes, let's say retail investors or our everyday individuals kind of forget that the real synergy takes time post acquisition? Yeah, and I don't know if they forget or not. Maybe it's not as appreciated, um, but it's part. It's part of what we do. We have, you know, we have. We actually have a whole team that's dedicated to working on. There's always beautiful corporate speak for these sort of things. Post integration or post closing integration, I think, is the is is the way to put that. But really, what it means is, okay, how do we all work together now? You know, what can we learn from you? What can you learn from us? And it's really about bringing best practices to bear. And it's also about finding 
more efficient ways of, of, of working. So over time, let's say, you know, you acquire a business in a, in a new state and it's got retail and it's got a, it's got a GP. I, I can tell you, for example, Nevada, you want to, when, when we acquired Nevada, you want to integrate your POS systems. You want to integrate the accounting systems so they, 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 they talk to each other. Um, there were some things they were doing on a growing side that actually was very interesting and we managed to learn from that and do it in some of our other locations. Um, you want to bring people onto your benefit scale, for example, right? You can't have um, worse or better benefits in one part of your organization versus 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 another. And when you acquire business, and by the way, we've done it all. But we've acquired licenses. That's very easy. You don't have to deal with anybody. You have zero employees, and you know you build an app and you hire everyone. Um, but we've done two acquisitions um, that had you know Massachusetts had over 100 people, and I forget what the number was in Lulee's in Nevada, but somewhere around that. And you have to do the work up front. Firstly. You know, we identify kind of the key people that we want to keep. So typically, there's a seller group, and then there's you know some of them are just bye bye, made my money, I'm going to go off and do something else. They may actually have kind of checked that for a year or two. They were part of the founding story, but maybe not there day to day. Then there's key people who are kind of there every day, and they're part of the fabric of the company. You want to retain them. So part of the deal making is you do a deal with them to retain them, and then you know we will send way before closing, we will send HR team and kind of senior leaders from, from each one of our teams for what I would call like town halls and Q&A sessions, right? There's a, particularly for the company that's getting sold, there's a lot of uncertainty for, for the employees. Am I still going to have a job? Who am I reporting to? What will my benefits be? I mean, there's question upon question upon question. I think a lot of, a lot of success is predicated not just on picking the right assets, but you got to get the soft side, the people side of it right. So we were, we're actually really proud. Our now chief town officer, or chief people officer, and Nicole Upshaw, uh, recently got promoted to that role. Before that, she was our EVP of human resources. We made HR an executive VP position very early on here because it really is a people business, and we recognize that. So, yeah, a lot of the post closing planning actually revolves around people and involves around you know, some improvements that we typically make to the facility. So um, we like auto cures, we like wet bucking, we'll bring that, but we'll also learn from others. So it's a, there's a tremendous lift that happens once you actually, once you close something. Have you guys made any acquisitions where the strongest asset for the business was the people? No, but it was part of, but it was part of, you know, if you had to, no, because in, in, in Canada, you still, when we're making acquisition, we're still, uh, Massachusetts was to enter the Massachusetts market. We got a GP and we got two great stores. Um, one really fantastic store and one good store. In, in New Leaf, we got um, two stores in Vegas, a store in Tahoe, and a GP. You don't do those... I got to think about how I say this. The people are... Because the people are very important. You don't do it just because of the people, okay? But you wouldn't want to have done either one of these deals if you thought the leadership sucked or the people sucked or you have to make it, it's just, it, it's just too much, it's just too much change um, to, to want to do that, right? You want to basically come into something that is well run unless it's totally run down and the asset is great and you're just buying it for, for that run down kind of, kind of, kind of price. But um, no, I'd say if there's somebody that's so great, you probably just want to try and hire them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's probably way more affordable to buy an individual than it is to buy multiple stores in a limited license state. I mean, in fairness, one of the first deals we did was uh, was basically a consulting business, um, and you know we didn't pay a lot for the for the consulting part of it. Yeah, we paid some, but really what we wanted is that became the core of our of our operations group early on. So yes, we have paid money effectively. To, to, to get great people. That was very, very early on. And they're still, you know, that core team is still with us today. They're like the Navy SEALs. We deploy them in every facility. Whenever we make an acquisition, they bring best, best practices from, um, they really are kind of our chief competency center and chief knowledge of, of anything cannabis. We have to do that, right? In the beginning, we're a bunch of, when we started, I mean, we're, we're entrepreneurs, we're investors, but we're in cannabis people. We have to get that, but not since. What's the most misunderstood thing 
about Juicy Holdings? I think the thing to keep in mind with us is a lot of what we've done is we're very, very medium and long term focused. So Virginia, we've been we've been investing for two years. And if you're looking for kind of if this year you were looking for immediate um, kind of results, but we didn't put that kind of money into Virginia because it's just a medical market that's very, very small. We did that because we're looking at January 1st, 2024. Um, we're going to be the only operator in an area of two and a half million people. By the way, great median household income, excuse millennials, excuse can't afford the product. It, it's kind of it's almost your ideal kind of customer customer base. We did that in anticipation of that. So I'd say it's, it's understanding how much investment we've made into our core businesses, Virginia and Pennsylvania, into the GPs. And that 23 is a huge transformative year for us where um, those investments should, should pay off. That comes in a number of ways. One is when we didn't have any GPs, we weren't selling any of our own products in our stores. So we didn't have any of our own products. I think now we're somewhere around 20% of retail sales are from our own brand of product. And that number has huge upside, right? I mean, there's there's no reason why why it shouldn't be, you know, fifty percent of what we sell in 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 our Pennsylvania and Virginia stores shouldn't be our own product. Maybe even, maybe even more. When you do that, the margins get so much better, right? Growing it, it should be much better because we've put that much capex into it. Otherwise, if you could just buy it as cheap as you could grow it, you would just buy it. You wouldn't put the capex into it. So it's really understanding how much investment we've made in that twenty three, twenty four. Those are the big years for us. So I'd say a lot of investors, specifically common about juicy investors or cannabis investors, I think that's true overall to markets. Um, investors are very, very short-term focused. You look at the quarterly number and it's, you know, you read a report that says, well, expectation was 7.9 million revenue. It's got 7.7. It's a miss. And I'd say, you know, 7.9, 7.7, .7, same thing. But really what matters is, is a 40 in three years' time. Or I'm making up these numbers, but you, you understand the point I'm trying to make. It's it's trying to get away. We understand it's important for investors to get quarterly updates. And of course, we, we do it and we have to do it. We're a public company. We chose to to, to do so. Um, but it's, you know, don't look at 22. Don't look at 23. Look at 24. Look at what 25 could be. I think that's that's really what's important. That's why we're all in this. That's when you start to see the ROI on those investments that you made long term. That's exactly right. Pennsylvania, here's what you need to look for. Virginia opening up adult use. Pennsylvania opening up adult use. That's going to be... That's the trigger for us. When you started your journey in the cannabis space, what did you get right? And most importantly, what did you get wrong? Being in the space in the first place, I'd say that's a decision that was right. Okay? Being there, being part of the game, being, being, being part of the group of people that gets to build both this company and the industry. I think that was, it's a big decision to make for all of us when we, when we made it and feel really, really great about, about that decision. I'd say, you know, one of the things that, that I, that I learned from Jim when I started in the hedge fund space is you want to arrange your kind of investments in such a way that hopefully you have, like, you make a whole bunch of bets. And then hopefully a few of those turn out to be way better than you thought. And you kind of let those, you let those ride. That's what gives you the upside. And then when you, when you whiff, whiff small, recognize it quickly, you know, by the way, speed and agility and raising your hand saying, oops, there's a problem. Very, very important. That's how you avoid turning something small into, into a catastrophe. So. We have a few investments that we made that aren't great. We we won a hemp processing license in New York. We did a couple. We bought some biomass. We tested it out to see if that would work. Okay, we probably sunk. I don't know how much we sunk into. I'll be directly correct. Maybe a million bucks, but we didn't build a facility that would have cost us forty or fifty million to do so. We've made mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. It just has to be part of your of your of your thinking. In the hedge fund days, I used to track that. And like a really good year, really good year, was the year in which I'd get maybe two thirds of my decisions right. That's a really good year. So you have to arrange your life in you know in a way where you just know like about a third of what I do or twenty five percent of what I do is wrong, but you don't turn it into a catastrophe. So yeah, we have a we have a we have a list of decisions where you look at it now. Would you do it again? No, you wouldn't. Did it make a difference to the company? Nah, not really. So. I'd say we've gotten a few big things really right. Our Illinois stores, our Pennsylvania positioning, our Virginia license, 
um, our our acquisition. And then, yeah, we've you know we pooped a few times, relatively small. So, loon shots, Kellen. Loon shots. So, before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests if you could sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation. What would it be? Spend more time listening than talking. All right. Prediction. I say as I'm talking for 45 minutes. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. Oliver, prediction time. With endless variables and challenges in cannabis, are we moving towards a major consolidation in the cannabis industry? If so, where? If not, why? I think it's a question of, of, of what period, period, period in time. I think consolidation in, in the industry is unavoidable and, and makes a lot of sense. You know, Ask yourself this question. How many public companies does this one industry really need? Um, there's a lot of duplication that comes with that, particularly in our industry. So, do you know, um, director and officer insurance? Man, that's expensive. Being public, it costs millions every year just to be public. Um, every company has compliance departments, accounting, um, legal, BD teams. You know, how many of these do you need duplicated across, across, across the industry? I think there's a lot of smaller players that have where the, underli- the underlying assets in many cases have a reason to exist, but the corporate doesn't. Right? Why do you need like a single state operator? Why does that need to be, you know, it's like that number 28 cannabis company in, 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 in the U.S. Why does that need to be public with a stock that nobody looks at and it doesn't trade in, in the first place? So, yeah, consolidation, I think, makes a lot of sense. You need size in order to be able to pay for all these extra costs. They look at 280 alone. You need to be able to raise money to to afford that. I mean, what smaller t- players do is they just don't pay it. I mean, guess how many guess how many dispensaries I've come across, particularly in California, where we start looking at the balance sheet and we ask the question, "Have you paid your taxes?" And they say, "Well, what's that? We don't want to. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to. We don't. We don't want to tell you." And it's like, okay, thank you. That's you know, that's the that's the end of that conversation. So, uh, consolidation has to happen. Um, I don't know how many players are going to be left. It's more than two or three, five, six, seven, maybe, maybe something, something like that. I think that's probably the amount that makes sense. There's, all, there's also going to be a continuing kind of ecosystem of, of private players. Um, but over time, I, I think it massively consolidates. Um, what was, it, was, it was a two-part question. There was something about, if I said yes, then you had a follow-up. What was the follow-up? Where? Um, which, everywhere. Which, yeah. I mean, where and in which state? All of it. Yeah. I'd say all of it. It's going to get fairly consolidated. By the way, but there's there's always going to be opportunity for for innovation and change. I mean, look at alcohol. People are starting alcohol brands now. There's new tequilas every year. I mean, how many tequilas do we need? I have no idea. But people are starting successful businesses. So, you know, consolidation happening, that doesn't mean the world becomes corporate and it's all corporate weed and you can't have innovation, you know. If you come up with a great idea for a product or a form factor or a brand, there's always going to be there's, there's going to be space for that. But you know, how many big companies or medium-sized companies do we need? Maybe not as many as we have now. I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Kellen, I just want to quickly just highlight the industry we're working in, where you are looking for acquisitions, and one of the questions is, uh, did you pay your taxes? Like, <laughs> like what other industry is like <laughs> part of your checklist? Like, okay, do you pay your taxes? Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's always part of the checklist, by the way, but rarely is the answer is openly, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. As far as consolidation goes, I think it has to happen. I think that it's the only way you're going to create operational efficiencies that allow for the ROI from the massive amount of capital that's been invested in the infrastructure. Um, I think there'll probably be five to 10 players globally, most likely would be my guess. I would, I would, I would bet maybe three to four just in the US, and then you'll probably see three or four large international conglomerates, right, out of Canada and South America. But I think it's the only way the industry succeeds, right? If you look at like tobacco and and alcohol, yes, there's microbreweries, but for the longest time in the alcohol industry, it was just a couple players building massive facilities in order to supply the entire country, right? It, it, it wasn't until recently where we had all these microbrews and, and other like smaller companies coming onto the scene. Yeah. So I think it, it has to happen in order to create a healthy industry. What do you think, Brian? 
I think people get up in arms when they hear the word consolidation, right? Like we're talking about large MSOs who are vertically integrated in multiple states. Like that's ridiculous, right? People should specialize in what they do best and allow the the strong to survive because small players can still thrive when industry has specialists. And I think as we move towards more specialists in certain regions, I think you'll see smaller players still doing really well. Do they need to be publicly traded? That's outside my wheelhouse and understanding how those things work out. But I think there'll be opportunities for everyone across the map to really lock in on what they do best and allow for the bigger players to hone in on their skill sets as well. And I think at the end of the day, people that benefit most are not only the internal people, but also the end, end customer who gets a better product at probably a more affordable price. I really appreciate what you, what you both are saying. And that focus on the customer, that's really what, what drives a lot of these things, right? Or really should. Agreed. So Oliver, for our listeners, they want to get in touch and they want to buy juicy products. Where can they find you? Well, you have to be a medical patient in Pennsylvania or Virginia or Ohio at this point. And you're very welcome at our Beyond Hello stores um, in Illinois. We're in the Sage area and the Bloomington Normal area with four fantastic stores called Beyond Hello. You're very welcome. Massachusetts, we're called Nature's Remedy. We're in Millbury and in Kingsboro. Please come. Mention my name. Nobody will know me. No. <laughs> um, you're very welcome to you're very welcome to come. And in Nevada, um, we're still operating under the new leaf name. So three stores in the uh, in the in the Vegas area, one in Tahoe, and then we've got stores in California under the Beyond Hello name in Palm Springs, Santa Barbara, and then and in Grove Beach. Thirty six stores in in total and growing. Awesome. Awesome. We'll link those all up in the show notes, uh, especially the one where we should name drop Oliver when you go to the stores. Thanks so much for taking the time. <laughs> I wonder what would happen. Guys, if you've enjoyed this podcast over the last few years, can you please take three minutes or less and leave us a quick review on Apple or Spotify? All reviews make a massive difference for us and help other people like you find this podcast. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you.